Welcome to Lake City Life. Today, we have with us an eminent economist, Professor Vivek Debra. He is the chairman of Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council and the member of Media. Welcome, sir. Sir, sir uh, we are discussing on the topics like a variety topics of economics. First one, uh, that recently government recapitalization package announced for 2.11 lakh crores for the revival of public sector banks with the problem of non-performing asset. So according to you, what are the suggestions that the reform should be accompanied with some structural basic changes in the banking, uh, public sector banking functioning? Thank you for inviting me for this discussion. But uh, notice the introduction that you gave me. You said I'm the chairman of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. So what that automatically means that any advice or any recommendations they, that we will give will be for the ears and the eyes of the Prime Minister. So my thoughts on the issue that you mentioned is not meant to be disseminated to the world at large because it is for the Prime Minister to take action on those. Recapitalization. Now on recapitalization, it is absolutely true that banks have a lot of stressed assets. We may give them names like NPAs or we may give them names like stressed assets, but the figure is pretty large. And it is really a legacy of various things that happened in the, in the past. So this is a stock, or what economists call a stock. There is an issue of prevention of fresh stressed assets. On that, the government has taken a lot of initiatives. But nonetheless, the problem of the stock of stressed assets remains. And until the bank's accounts are cleaned up, a, it will be very difficult for banks to lend and B, it will be very difficult even to sell the equity of those public sector banks were the government to be interested in selling that equity. The figure that you gave is of a total recapitalization package. It's an estimate. It is not what is going to come up out of the government's budget alone. Some of it will come from other sources. If you just went ahead and recapitalized and you did not correct the problems that led to the creation of those stressed assets in the first place, the problem will resurface again in the future. Therefore, any recapitalization will have to be linked with whatever is being done to reform the banks, particularly the public sector banks, sometimes even private sector sure. ones. As the finance minister has said, the details of the recapitalization package are still being worked out and they will be announced in due course. I am not going to preempt what the finance minister is going to tell all of us later on. Sir, uh, connecting with this uh, lending purpose because uh, we are experiencing uh, a recovery in the growth after the events of demonetization and destocking before GST. So uh, what are your suggestions to in order to revive the private investment in the economy? Because after reforms, <coughs> private investments are very important. You link that growth question with demonetization. There is no evidence whatsoever to suggest that that 5.7% growth in the last quarter was because of demonetization. There is no evidence whether that assertion comes from Dr. Manmohan Singh or someone else. So okay. I will correct you on that point. Private investments, there are a whole set of issues because it depends on the sector. Some of the issues we've already talked about because private investments, lending are also linked to banks being prepared to lend are also linked to people going to banks to ask for loans, all of that. Let us also recognize that in several segments, several sectors, there is still excess capacity in the private sector. Until that excess capacity is exhausted, there is no particular reason for investments to happen. 
in some cases public expenditure is a necessary catalyst for the private expenditure to happen for the private investment yes. to happen and there are several instances where the government has been increasing the amount on public expenditure i'm talking about union government mm -hmm. let me also quickly mention that about 50% of capital expenditure public capital expenditure now happens mm -hmm. by states yes. and states now have a lot of money because of the formula of the 14th finance commission having said that there are some segments where you can begin to see some segments where you can begin to see private investment beginning to happen there are examples like pharmaceuticals it related perhaps even steel commercial real estate not the residential residential kind so there are some segments i am inclined to think that in about two quarters we will begin to see a much more across the board increase okay. in private investments okay. sir recently like uh, india scored 100 rank on the index of ease of doing business and rating upgrades by modi to be a2 that is very beneficial for the indian economy so how will you see these uh, rating upgrades when we consider the international capital flow in our country Now, firstly, let's be clear. If one is undertaking the reforms, one is undertaking the reforms because the reforms make good sense because of purely domestic considerations. You do not introduce reforms because it helps you to improve the rankings in the World Bank's ease of doing business, doing business indicators, or because standards and poor Modi's or whoever it is yes. in. increases your rating those happen to be products or outcomes yes, as a result yes. of what india itself is doing the specific question you asked is about the rating agencies the rating agencies have biases and it's not that i am saying this the rating agencies have a pronounced bias against developing yep. countries yes. they tend to rate so called developed countries far higher than ought to be the case okay. an example of that is what they did with the developed countries before the global financial crisis. crisis or look at the kind of ratings these rating agencies gave india just before india actually came close to defaulting in 1990 1991 so therefore the track record of the rating agencies is not something to be very proud about you asked a question that linked it to foreign investments now foreign investments of what kind foreign domestic foreign direct investments fdi are decisions are taken by people who have already factored in whatever is happening in india so therefore to them the rating agencies upgrade downgrade stable doesn't really matter that much but don't get me wrong i'm not saying they are irrelevant they are mm -hmm. certainly relevant for foreign institutional investments Investors. particularly at the margin and they are of course important for the indian company private or public which is going abroad to access capital because the costs of capital become lower no. yes. sir as you were the part of railway restructuring board uh, because now right now india led the foundation of first bullet train So, how will you see these two contrasting events? Like, on the one hand, we have a bullet train, and on the other hand, existing railway are uh, struggling to run safely. So, what is your uh, opinion about how uh, we will balance, and in your view, how existing railway should be uh, done to make more safer for the people to travel? First, let me take the bullet train, and let me correct a myth that floats around. it's implicit the myth is implicit in the way you have phrased the question the impression is that the railway is using its own resources to fund the bullet train mm -hmm. then in which case your question would have been an entirely valid question but these are not the railway's own resources these are incremental resources which are coming to india on fairly attractive terms because of the japanese loan sure in other words had the bullet train not been there this money would not have been available so you can ask an entirely valid question about whether the bullet train will be viable or not and we can discuss that but don't link it to the domestic other issues of the railways 
Now you raised a question about safety and I will draw a rather technical distinction because it is important to draw the distinction. Safety is about things like accidents and deaths. Security is about crime. We are clearly talking about safety. safety. We are not talking about security. security. That's a different, different set of aspects. issues. We are also not talking about certain kinds of things which definitionally do not enter the railway accident figures today. Again, one can quibble about whether they should be there or not, but they are not technically a part of railway accidents. For example, if you cross a track because of your stupidity and get run over, that That's is not a railway accident. Sure. If you cross a level crossing um, and um, it, it happens to be unguarded and you happen to get run over, even if you're in a car, that's not technically a railway accident. On safety, it's a long set of issues. First thing to note is if I purely look at the accident numbers, number of accidents, passenger as well as freight, you will be surprised that India's track record is pretty good. good. Yes. It is pretty good in comparison to a country like the US. Yes. The difference, of course, is in the United States, when I have an accident, there are very few deaths. Fatalities Fatality. are very low. low. Yes. Accident numbers are yeah. not that bad in India. Fatalities are, are very high in India. One reason for that, or, or for all of safety, the fundamental issue is that the railways lacks resources. Yes. To have improved the safety record, you need resources. Yes. And the railways are today completely broke. There is no money. Part of the reason is low passenger fares, this, that and the other. But take for example the coaches. The coaches that coaches, all of us yes. travel on. Most of these coaches are what are called ICF coaches. ICF. And the more later coaches are known as LHB coaches. ICF coaches, the moment there is an impact, the deaths are very high. Okay. The LHB coaches climb on one, top, one on top of oh, another so also. that uh, there aren't that many deaths. Out of 50,000 coaches, Indian Railways has, out of 50,000, only about 8,000 or 8,500 are LHB. So one has to replace, replace those. Coaches are expensive, it's take time. So one set of issues is about coaches. The other set of issues is some of the tracks are very old. Yeah. And those tracks, the rails, they need to be replaced. That also takes money. The third set of issues is, let me use an example. Let's pick a railway station from... Uh, UP. Let's pick a station like Tundla. Tundla, every day there are 1200 trains, passenger plus goods passing Passing. every day. For anything, any piece of machinery and equipment, you need a certain amount of time for maintenance. The recommended time that you need for maintenance is two hours. Which you get on a metro because there is a window when you can do the maintenance. You look at a station like Tundla. This gap of two minutes between one train and another. I don't have the time for the maintenance. So obviously if you are going to pump in so many trains. And if railway ministers down the years have been profligate in terms of introducing more and more trains. Obviously, you're going to have yes. accidents. There is no point blaming the railways. Seriously. Collectively, we are to blame. Mm-hmm. So collectively, the answer mm-hmm. is too bad. Someday we'll build more tracks. Yes. But until we do that, I cannot run yeah. 1,200 trains through Tundla. Yeah. Let me reduce the number of trains. Seriously. But the moment you say something like that, yes. there'll be havoc. havoc. There'll be uproar. So these are a whole set of issues. It means it will take a gradually. Uh, these are long-term issues. Yes. But the more important issue is that we must, as passengers, sure. who influence MPs, who influence decision making, we must make it very clear. You cannot have punctuality, not punctuality. You cannot have speed and safety together. Yes. 
Today, when we travel on any U.S. airline or we travel on any airline going to the U.S., we all accept that the most important thing is safety. Are we prepared to accept that? I can get you from Delhi to Mumbai in 24 hours and I will ensure there are no accidents. But, but, but people also want the 10 hours. You can't have both at the same time. Because there's an inverse relation. Apart from economics, you are also interested in research. So like, for example, we see that India's uh, expenditure to research and development is far low when we compare to other countries such as South Korea, which is spends 5 to 6 percent of GDP. So according to you, in your opinion, what are uh, the measures we have to take in the research field to increase the inquisitiveness in the students and building an infrastructure for research and development? We use the word R&D, but there is very, very little of R in India. Most of it is actually development. Mm -hmm. There has been, there may be exceptions, but by and large, it is all very little of research. And it is not the public sector alone to blame. There is very little of private mm -hmm. R&D also. Yes. Part of it is linked to the entire culture. If you are going to do R&D, if you are going to have innovation, if you are going to have inventions, if you are going to go out and have patents, from day one, you have to be taught to take risks. Yes. You cannot be taught how to take risks unless you are taught to undergo failures. Yes. From the day you entered, from the day I entered, from the day XYZ entered kindergarten, you were taught do not take risks. Yes. So, the entire educational system has to change. Yes. I think a broader answer is you are making comparisons with South Korea today. But look in look at India's per capita income today and look at South Korea's per, per capita income. And perhaps it's an apples versus oranges comparison. In South Korea's R&D level was not that high in the 1970s. So perhaps what one is talking about is a transition. And maybe it's an unfair comparison to make. Because you said, you didn't give a figure, but yes, it is true that R&D expenditure is very low as a share of GDP. But in some sectors, pharmaceutical being one example, yes. it is quite high. So okay. maybe it's just a learning curve learning that we are on. Okay. So apart from subjective things, you are also interested in literature. That's your a vivid uh, quality. Like uh, I'm uh, hearing inquisitiveness about how you are in, interested in uh, like uh, Ramayana and ancient culture of Indian. Uh, what things have motivated you to go towards these cultural things? Uh, I can give you all kinds of different answers, which is the reason I hesitated. But let me give you some figures first. Let me ask you a question. It's a rhetorical question, so you're not, you're not expected to answer the question. Since the beginning of printing, since Gutenberg's Bible, how many books have been published in any language in the world ever? The United Nations has some kind of figure, any language, all languages put together. The figure is about 150 million. There is something called National Namami Mission, uh, called National Manuscript Mission on Namami. Namami is trying to list out how many manuscripts there are in India. Only list at the moment. Not um, digitize them, nothing like that. Just list. Let's have a list. Including private collections. And manuscript for purposes of Namami being defined as something that is more than 75 years old. And we are not talking about things through things. oral transmission. We are just talking about things that have been written down. Uh, so far, Namami has listed about 3.5 million manuscripts listed. Their estimate is there are 40 million manuscripts. 140 million, uh -huh. 50 million in India. Yeah. Some have gone out, no figures on those. Out of those 50 million manuscripts, 95% have not been translated. So we don't even no. know what is in them. All of them are not in Sanskrit. There are some in Pali also. 
and the language may be Sanskrit or Pali, but the script may be something else. And there are instances where we no longer have people alive who can read those scripts. Sharda in Kashmir being one example, there's no one surviving who can read the Sharda script anymore. So these things have to be translated, otherwise we are losing a treasure. We are increasingly running out of people who are who know Sanskrit. Particularly the younger generation is not that knowledgeable about Sanskrit. They are much more comfortable with English. They are not even that comfortable anymore with the vernacular languages. So someone needs to translate these Please. things into English. The proper, proper Sanskrit scholars are not that interested in translating things into English. And people who do translations into English do not know Sanskrit, which is how you have this strange anomaly of an economist getting into translations of Sanskrit. I'm giving you all kinds of reasons because there are all kinds of reasons that are intertwined into the same answer. Contrary to what people seem to think, people often ask me that why did you decide to translate the Mahabharata? Surely there are so many translations of Mahabharata floating around. On average, translations of the Mahabharata are very rare. Only three exist. Okay. That's Everything that you see is an average translation. There are just three unabridged translations of the Mahabharata. First one done by Kishoni Mohan Ganguly, note the years, between 1885 and 1895. Okay. Second one done by Manmatana Datta between 1895 and 1905. And after that, the third one is mine. In between, there was a translation that was started in the 1970s by Professor Van Buitenen at the University of Chicago. Van Wittenen died halfway, couldn't complete it, so the Chicago translation is still in incomplete. I will give you one example from that. I was reading Van Wittenen's translation. And this is, the Mahabharata is not only about the Kaurav Pandav story, there's a lot more in the Mahabharata. Although because of the abridged tellings, many people think it's just about the Kurukshetra war and the Kurus and the Pandavas. There is a story in the Mahabharata about Nala and Damayanti, when Nala gambles. And the Mahabharata says that evil had gone into Nala's body. Van Buitenen's translation, I was reading Von Van Buitenen's translation. It says, Kali had got into Nala's body. And I thought, what? At the time of the Mahabharata, in the Mahabharata, Kali, that's not possible. So I looked up the original and it was actually Kali. So Van Buitenen got completely confused between Kali as in the goddess and Kali as in evil or Kali Yuga, that Kali. At one level, it is a completely negative thing to complain about what Westerners are doing if we ourselves don't begin to translate. And I will give you a last one because I can go on and on about this. I will give you a last trigger. Some, you see, I have never been formally trained in Sanskrit. It's not that I studied Sanskrit when I was young. I began to, I got interested in Sanskrit about 35 years ago. That's about it. So all of this is over the last 35 years. So I will give you one trigger. And you have to be patient with me because I'm going to recite a little bit of Sanskrit. This is from the Valmiki Ramayana and all of us know that Rama knows that Sita is in Lanka. The news has been brought to him and he's, this is Kishkinda, Kishkinda Kanda uh, and he's waiting for the monsoon to be over so that he can go and invade. Impatient, waiting to fight, wait. Valmiki, whom he cannot date, describes the monsoon clouds. There are clouds up there. And it says, I will translate, don't worry. Vidyut pataka savalaka mala shailendra kota kriti sannikasha garjanti megha samudirna nada matta gajendra ivasan yugastha. Vidyut pataka, the clouds are tinged with lightning. 
Savalaka Mala, garlanded by cranes. Shailendra Kota, Kriti Sannikasha, clouds look like mountains. mountains. What do the mountains look like? Garjanti Megha, Samudirna Nada, Matta Gajendra, Evasan Yugastha, the clouds are thundering like gigantic elephants. And what are these elephants doing? The elephants are fighting. Cut to perhaps 500 years later. We cannot date either poet. So we do not know about Valmiki, we do not know about Kalidas 500 years later. And um, Kalidas wrote a smaller Kavya called Megadutam, mm -hmm. which is full of descriptions about this part of the country, in and around Ujjain in particular. And Megadutam, there is no story. Or it is a very artificial kind of story because here is this Yaksha. The Yaksha has been derelict in his duties. He has been vanished by Kuber. He is in exile for one year. He is pining for his beloved. He sees the cloud and sends the cloud off as a messenger, Megadutam, to Alakapuri to carry a message to his wife and then it comes back. Again, I will translate right towards the beginning. Second shloka of Megadutam. I will translate. Asha Rasya Prathama Devase Megham Ashlishta Sanum Vapra Krira Parinata Gaja Prekshaniyam Dadasya. First day in the month of Asar, Megham Ashlishta Sanum, the mountains are covered with clouds. Vapra Krira Parinata Gaja Prekshaniyam Dadasya. He saw that. And what are the elephants doing? They are playing. So in one case, Rama waiting to fight. What are the elephants doing? Fighting. In another case, the Yaksha pining for his beloved. What are the elephants doing? Playing. And it sort of hit me. that If I do not read this, I am missing out on something in life. So it is very, very long answer. Sir, at last, please share your experience with Jagran Lake City University. Oh, it was a wonderful experience. I have been to Bhopal many times. And... Um, I had unfortunately never visited Jagran Lake uh, University before. So I'm delighted, A, that I've been invited at this convocation, and uh, B, of course, that in some sense I've become an alumnus because of the honorary doctorate. So I've enjoyed it enormously. I hope I will be back. As the last word, let me tell you something that you don't know, and many people don't know, and I want to place this on record. Uh, the chief guest at your second conv convocation was uh, Professor Madhav Menon, you know, Madhav Menon. Rather remarkable that in 1994, Professor Madhav Menon and I uh, wrote a book together. It's called Aspects of Legal Reform in India. That's great, sir. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. We are very thank delighted you. for your presence. Thank you. We are signing off from Lake City News.